Welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Pfeffer, a professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, an author of 16 books on a range of topics, including the topic of my oversubscribed MBA class and this podcast, Power. Every other week, I talk to someone about their path to power and provide you with practical guidance about how to accelerate your career. Today's guest is my colleague, Professor Deborah Grunfeld of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Deborah has written academic articles about power, but more relevant to our conversation today, she's written a book entitled Acting with Power, and she teaches at Stanford a class on acting with power. And so Professor Grunfeld, Deborah, is someone who has thought a lot about power and particularly the effect of physical body language and language on power. So welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Deborah. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. So let me begin by having you reprise some material from your book and the class. As you say on a very wonderful YouTube video, that we react to people mostly on the basis of how they look, secondly, on how they sound, on the least important, on the content of what they say. And so therefore, how people show up and how they act is fundamentally important to whether or not people grant them power or not. So talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about, and I'll ask you more specific questions if you want, and talk a little bit about the evolution of your Acting with Power class, and for that matter, your Acting with Power book, which is fabulous. Sure. Thanks for having me here today, Jeff. It's going to be great fun to talk with you about this. You know, the first question you asked is that it occurred to me at some point, and I can talk to you a little bit about where I got the revelation, that the first decision that people have to make when they decide whether to allow you to have influence or not is to decide whether you're someone who should be paid attention to. That's the very first decision that people make. And those decisions are made very, very quickly on the basis of visuals and nonverbal cues that most of us are not really in control of. So my premise in developing the curriculum and writing the book that I wrote was just that it would be helpful to many people to have a better sense for the kinds of things that we do inadvertently with our bodies, with the way we speak, with the way we carry ourselves that help us to have influence and which of those choices get in our way. So let me ask you a question that comes immediately from what you just said. And that is, you say we do these things inadvertently, but presumably part of the premise of the book and the class is that one can be more strategic about this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a question I get all the time. Can we really change the way we show up? And of course, I think the answer is yes, or I wouldn't teach the course that I teach. But there are two ways I think that are useful in terms of trying to understand this challenge. The first one is that it's just a question of learning and personal growth. All throughout our lives, we have a certain set of capabilities and habits And we need to break through barriers to grow and to become more expert and to be more accomplished and to develop different ways of looking at things. And this is a kind of a lifelong journey. So the fact that you're used to carrying yourself in a way that is designed to indicate humility or the fact that you have been a fantastic subordinate most of your career and you carry yourself in a way that makes your superiors feel very comfortable with you is no reason to think that you can't develop other ways of showing up that will allow you to be successful in other contexts and other kinds of roles. So I really think of it as a challenge, like everything else, of just learning and personal growth. And, you know, so there are two important pieces of evidence for this. One is to just observe yourself. I mean, anyone can do this. Observe the way you've grown, the capacities you've developed. I think We've all had these experiences. There was a day you couldn't ride a bike and then the next day you could. And the second is to look at how actors can believably and in truthful ways completely transform themselves in order to have a particular kind of impact in the context of a performance. I think of human behavior and 
the way we approach social life is not very different, actually, on a day-to-day basis from what actors do. We're all trying to bridge the gap between the most familiar versions of ourselves, the versions of ourselves that feel most authentic, and the jobs we're trying to do and the roles we're trying to play. Actors have techniques for doing this, and regular humans don't. So one of the things that I've done in developing the curriculum and writing the book was to work very closely over over a long period of time now with theater professionals, actors, directors, writers, to internalize what it is that they're learning to do and repackage that actually for professionals in all kinds of other industries. So you use, I think, a wonderful phrase from your fabulous introductory lecture in which you talk about the fact that even though people don't like to believe this, we're all playing a role. Yeah, absolutely. We are absolutely all playing a role. Some of us are acting like professors. (laughs) Some of us are acting like CEOs. Some of us are acting like doctors, but we are all playing a role. That's right. Can you talk about some of the techniques that you teach your students about how to show up in a more authoritative or powerful way? Absolutely. Even if perhaps they're not feeling powerful or authoritative? Yes. So just to give you a little bit of context for this, what I would say is there really are two approaches that anyone can effectively use when trying to show up in a more authoritative way. One set of tactics or techniques is what I call outside-in techniques, and they have to do really with just changing how you carry yourself, changing your physical body, how you stand, how you use your arms, how you use your eyes, how you sit. The other set of tactics that I really think is equally important, maybe even more important in some cases, is what I call inside-out tactics. And the inside-out tactics have to do with having ways to reframe situations and our role in those situations that are empowering. One of the things I like to say in my classes, there are a lot of things about power and social life that are not under our control. We can't, for example, control directly how people perceive us, but we can always control once we know how, where our attention goes. And if you think about what's going on in the minds of professionals everywhere, probably in the minds of some of your listeners, there are monologues, there are monsters in there, there are people who are talking to us about who we are and what we're entitled to and how we're supposed to show up and what we should be worried about. And you can take control of those conversations and those images and those framings of situations in ways that allow you to show up really as a different person because you've reframed the situation you're walking into. It sounds to me, and you should correct me if I'm wrong about this, that what you just were talking about is what I call rule one in the seven rules of power, which is getting out of your own way. That if you don't feel you deserve power, almost no one else It's going to be hard for you to show up in a way that will convince any other human being that you deserve power. We talk about the imposter syndrome. How did I get here? I'm the admission mistake at Stanford, or that's right. I got promoted to this job that I don't deserve. That's right. And so I think the inside out thing says you need to work on yourself first, because if you're going to show up in a powerful way, you have to believe that you deserve the position that you're in, that you actually deserve to be as you are a full professor at Stanford, if you think you were like a hiring mistake, you're never going to show up with power. That's right. And this requires really using your imagination. And this is one of the things that I've learned from people in the theater arts, you know, which is it's not just a question of reframing your beliefs, but you really have to imagine alternative realities and put yourself in those realities in a way that's so committed that it completely transforms you without your realization. So I'll give you an example. One of my favorite stories about how this kind of thing can work comes from an interview that was done at the GSB maybe a decade ago now with Oprah Winfrey. So she came and gave a talk at View from the Top. I don't know if you saw it. And someone in the audience asked her, how do you approach walking into a meeting where you know you're going to be the only person of color and the only woman in the room? How do you gather the confidence to approach that situation in a way that allows you to show up as the powerful person that you are. And she said, well, first of all, I don't walk in as the only woman and person of color. That's not how I walk in. She said, what I do before I go into a room like that is I spend some time alone. Sometimes I lock myself in a closet. Sometimes I go in the bathroom and I 
close my eyes and I imagine all the names and faces of other women and other people of color who have entered rooms like this before me. And I imagine when I'm going into that room that they're with me. So when I walk into the room, I'm walking in as part of an army. I'm not walking in by myself. I'm not alone. I don't feel vulnerable. I feel very much surrounded by the energy of of other people who have fought this fight and very much empowered by it. It's just a great example of the power of your imagination. It's not anyone else's experience of her in that room, but it's true for her. It is actually true for her. And by allowing that truth and that experience to take over what she's thinking about, she can enter the room in a much more powerful way. And there are lots of examples where I've used this technique, where I've coached other people to use this technique. It's actually not a difficult thing to do at all once you give yourself permission to use your imagination and create a different scene in your head. That makes good sense. Talk to me a little bit also about the outside in. That's it. I think the inside out is fundamental. And I would argue that without the inside out, the outside in isn't probably going to work. That's right. But tell me a little bit about the outside in as well. So I've now convinced myself that I'm not walking into the room alone or I'm not walking into the room and into the lion's den or something, but I still want to show up in a more powerful fashion. What are some of the outside in things that I can do? Sure. I mean, we can start with the idea of walking into a room. So one of the first questions would be, how quickly are you moving? So that would be one thing to notice, that someone with a lot of power and status and authority has the right to take ownership of the time and move slowly in a way that's comfortable, that doesn't exert excess energy for no reason. So moving very slowly, taking longer strides as opposed to shorter ones is another one that's associated with power, with dominance, with approaching a situation with more energy and more agency, I would say. A very important aspect of the nonverbal or physical presence associated with power has to do with how open you are in your upper body. So having an open chest, this is really important. And it's kind of counterintuitive because being open in some ways feels very vulnerable and it is. But when you have a lot of power, you can afford to be vulnerable. This is why the alpha gorillas sit with everything exposed because nobody's coming for them. It's the lower down ranking animals that have to protect their bodies. So having an open chest in particular conveys a lot of authority and power. And that's an especially important technique for people who are smaller in stature. So people always ask me, well, if I can't carry myself like a tall person and I can't dominate someone physically with my height, what options do I have? And I often tell them the most important thing is that you carry yourself with an open chest because what you're communicating when your arms are capable of moving away from your body is that you are ready to fight for whatever you want, regardless of how big you are. And those messages have a tendency to make others back down a little bit. And also, of course, you take up more space by doing that. 100%. That's right. And taking up space says, and when you sit down, I've seen people take up more space at the table and spread their stuff out. And so part of taking up space says, I just get to control more of the physical environment. I own more of the physical environment. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, I often use taking, I think taking space is probably the simplest way to remember what this whole set of tactics and strategies is. So There's taking up physical space in the way you just described by sitting at the table. You know, we often joke about how people in positions of power use furniture wrong. They spread out and put their arms across three chairs instead of sitting in just one. They put their feet on the desk instead of putting their feet on the floor. So the physical space and taking more space and kind of owning the physical turf is part of it. But taking more space also means taking more time. So that's the part that's related to speaking more slowly, to moving more slowly, to getting comfortable holding the silence in a room. And then also, I guess the third aspect of this that I think is really interesting to think about has to do with taking other people's space, meaning how polite you are about violating other people's boundaries. So you can, you know, hold yourself in a large way and take up a lot of physical space 
another way that people and animals communicate dominance and power is by invading other space. So physically touching someone on the arm or standing a little closer than is comfortable for the other person, offering a hug without waiting for permission. I mean, all of these things are also ways of claiming space by sort of allowing yourself to own other people's space as well as your own. And I'm sure you've seen the classic pictures of Lyndon Johnson. Oh, yeah. Leaning over people and getting out under their chin and standing quite close to them, which is a fabulous example of what you're just talking about. It's fantastic. It's fabulous. And what's interesting, too, is something I've done in my class when I talk about this is I have a lot of pictures of female leaders who do the same things. And it's interesting to see because people will often ask, well, I mean, if women aren't physically bigger, like, can they actually pull these things off? And it turns out it doesn't really matter. It's not something that people code. So, you know, there is this research that shows that women are not punished for physical dominance and aggression in the same way that they're punished for verbal aggression and argumentation. In part, I think it's because we just don't even have time to process the gender element of things. If someone is using their body in a way that suggests they're not afraid of you, you take that at face value and you give them the right to be in control. So Angela Merkel's a great example. There's some great pictures of her leaning over Trump. I don't know if you've seen them. I love to watch Christine Lagarde, the head of the Central Bank of Europe. She's also absolutely fabulous with her body. But I have a lot of photographs just like that Lyndon Johnson photograph of women doing the same thing. And one of the things that comes to my mind as you're talking about this is that a lot of And I think it's important for the listeners to understand this, that a lot of people's reactions to what you're talking about are, in fact, unconscious. So it's not like somebody says, oh, Deborah Grunfeld has spread her books out over the table, so therefore she's making a power move. A lot of this is completely subconscious or unconscious. And so our reactions to people are almost primitive in that sense. I think that's right. Very much primitive, very much automatic, very much based in survival instincts, you know, The first decision you have to make whenever you encounter another person in the wild is whether you're physically safe or not. That's the first thing you need to know. And so if someone does something, even with a big smile, that suggests they're willing to use their body in order to get what they want, it makes many of us back down. And the implication of this, which I will draw out and we'll see whether or not you agree with me, is because it does come from this kind of primitive thing about figuring out who's the friend and who's the foe. Are you safe or are you not? This suggests that what you, you and I are talking about is going to be reasonably constant across cultures and over time because the primitive, unconscious, subconscious thing about am I safe? Am I at risk? Am I a danger? Am I going to be okay? Is something that is not particularly culturally or generationally dependent. This is going to be true over time and it's going to be true across cultures. Yeah. Well, I think it's true. And I have one caveat. So I have a hypothesis I want to run by you and I wonder where you think it's true. One of the things I've noticed as I've been doing this work and thinking hard about, you know, advising students about what they should do when and whether it's safe and whether it's risky is if you pay attention to physical dominance, you know, using your body in a threatening or intimidating way, In many cases with animals, it's in response to a threat. It's often in response to a challenge where you would see an animal showing greater dominance, let's say. And part of what that leads me to think is that in cultures like ours, where power is always contested, nobody takes anything for granted, there's lots of social mobility, we believe in everyone's right to power and status, at least theoretically, right? So you could say, yes, I I know you're my boss, but give me three months. When you live in a culture like that, you would expect to see people in positions of power using more dominance, because you have to keep reminding people and reinforcing the reality of the situation. You might predict, and I just don't know if this is true, I wonder if you think it's true, that in cultures where power distance is greater and there's more stability around hierarchies, so hierarchies aren't called into question the same way, you might expect to see people in positions of power showing up much smaller. I think that's possible. One of the questions that I would pose, there are certainly cultures where power 
and status is less contested, but I think it's probably contested to some extent almost everywhere. Yeah. Even in Asian cultures, which tend to be somewhat more hierarchical and formal, I can see contests there. Yeah. I would change the topic slightly to talk about one other interesting aspect of your work that I think is important for our listeners to pay attention to. So as you know, I'm a big fan of Acting with Power. I'm a huge fan of your class. I'm a huge fan of your book. I think that you've done extraordinarily important work. One of the things, however, that comes across, and I'm told this both from your class, which I have not had the privilege of sitting in on, but it's certainly true for the book, which I've looked at and read, is there is a certain amount of ambivalence about power. So one of the differences between you and me is that my class has no ambivalence (laughs) about power. I tell people basically go for it and whatever. But both the class and the book, you talk about playing high and playing low. There is a little bit more, I would say, contingency or ambivalence. And so I would love for us to spend just a very few minutes talking about that and talk about where, where that comes from and how you talk to your students about that. Sure. I mean, the first thing that I would say that I think is obvious, but doesn't come across necessarily when people think in a kind of an instinctual way about power, is that being in the high position is not without risks. That's absolutely true. A friend of mine who was an advisor to Swiss CEOs and financial services firms said to me, when you are at the top, most of the people who report to you believe that they deserve the job more than you do. That's right. And some of them will wait and some of them won't. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So I refer to this phenomenon, I'm writing about this now, as upward contempt. I didn't make that phrase up, but I do think it is a really like a natural and very pervasive part of life in hierarchical context, which is that we tolerate people in positions of power because we have to. But we often have ambivalent feelings, not only about our own power, but about the fact that they have power and more status than we do. So that feels risky to some people. I think probably the more concise way to think about it is to say that I believe that there's a universal desire for status and there's no upward limit on how much status people want to have. So status is, you know, the extent to which other people respect and admire you. I I think everybody wants more status and I don't think there's an upper limit. Not everybody wants power, actually. So power is different. Power requires you to make difficult decisions and be accountable for things that may reduce your status, right? So if you care more about respect than control, you might prefer to occupy a high position, but not the highest position. So this is something, you know, I've, I've done some research on as well, which is we do find that a lot of people actually, if you give them the option to rank first in a group versus ranking second or lower, a lot of people will choose the second rank because it comes with a lot of status but not that much responsibility and not that much risk of being held accountable for a negative outcome. So I think people are actually really afraid of the responsibility that comes with power. That's part of it. And something else that I'm very aware of is that there are people who just feel that it's not who they are to carry themselves in a way that takes ownership of superiority or authority or control or having interests and experiences and expertise that are privileged above other people's. They're just people who who feel like they can't do that. And I think it's one of the big challenges that a lot of executives face. And in this way, I think we're really aligned, which is that most people realize they need to be comfortable with power in order to be successful, but they have to get past this fear of being held accountable, fear of losing status, fear of making enemies, And also fear of failing to show up as an authentic, powerful person when how you really feel is a little bit smaller. I think it's a great answer, and I think it's exactly right. And one of the things that I think both of our classes try to do, and many other classes as well, is to try to get people over their reluctance. Because what I say to my class, and I'm sure you say it in your class as well, is there nature of horrors of vacuum, there's going to be a CEO, there's going to be a dean, there's going to be a school superintendent, there's going to be a president of the United States. And if it's not you, 
it's probably going to be somebody else. And maybe that somebody else is less honest and ethical than you. That's right. Maybe that other person is less benign than you. Maybe that person is going to be more selfish than you. And so you have a choice. You can either lean in, pardon the expression, you can lean into that power, but you can't say we're going to have, which many people have tried to say, we're going to have equality and there's not going to be a hierarchy because the world is fundamentally hierarchical. That's right. I mean, the way I sometimes put it to my students is I say, don't leave power to the bad guys. Yeah. This is the same message. Something interesting, too, that that you might find, I, I actually found this really illuminating and it's helpful for me when people ask me about how to get comfortable with seeing yourself as someone who's pushing people around and interrupting and being intimidating and using fear to get things done and being strategic. I heard a talk yesterday by Diana Chapman Walsh, who was the president at Wellesley College for 14 years, and she just wrote a memoir. And she was talking about how when she moved into that role, she was very ambivalent about the power that came with the role. She couldn't really see herself in the role. She was very self-conscious about it. She was very worried she wasn't going to be successful. And I asked her how she got over it. And what she said was, as soon as I had problems to solve, I got over it. In the abstract, where all you're thinking about is yourself and what you're doing and your identity, and is this a good thing for me to do? Nothing matters more than how you're perceived by other people. But in the real world, what I always say I hope for all my students is that the things they're going to be working on are more important than how they're perceived. And I hope for them that they'll be in a situation where they're willing to do whatever it takes in order to solve those problems. And for those situations, they need to understand how to carry themselves as a person who has power and authority. So she said, you know, as soon as she had problems to solve, it got very easy. And as soon as she had people around her treating her as the person in charge, it got much easier as well. So I do think there's this gap where when it's theoretical, you know, and you're trying to imagine yourself in these situations, it feels very risky in certain ways and very threatening to your ego, I guess. And then once you get into a job and you're able to focus on solving problems, it's very uncomplicated at that point. You just do whatever you have to do in order to to get it done. First of all, I think it's a fantastic answer. I think that's a great way to end our podcast. I think it really is an excellent summary. In theory, I'm worried about how everybody perceives me. I'm worried about this. Once you're in the situation and you've got a task to do, then all of a sudden it becomes a focus on the task, not on how everybody else in the world is perceiving you. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast, where every other week we talk to an accomplished individual about their path to power and the practical lessons for you. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on any of your favorite sources, including Apple and Spotify, and buy my most recent book on power, Seven Rules of Power. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, which is, I guess, now X, and jeffreypfeffer.com. Pfeffer on Power is a production of Stanford and University FM. And today we have been talking with Professor Deborah Grunfeld, author of the famous book, Acting with Power, and as instructor of a class on that same topic, Acting with Power. Deborah, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast, where every other week we talk to an accomplished individual about their path to power and the practical lessons for you. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on any of your favorite sources and buy my most recent book on power, Seven Rules of Power. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and jeffreypfeffer.com. Pfeffer on Power is a production of Stanford University and University FM.